How thrilling to be back at five by 15 in the shadow of Hawks and of Antonia Fraser. Um, pleasure to be here. Da -dum. When I was maybe 20 years old, I one day was talking to my mother and she said, apropos of something, you know, if I had been born 15 years later, I bet I would have had an interesting career and that I would have found a lot of fulfillment in it. And I said, do you wish you had been born 15 years later? She thought for a moment and she said, actually, I wish I'd been born 15 years earlier, in which case the whole idea would never have crossed my mind. <laughs> she was part of a transitional generation, and I'm part of a transitional generation too. And the choices that we make can be very different. When I was growing up, I had the idea that there was a terrible conflict between the two things that seemed most important to me. One was to be authentic to myself, which included the fact that I was gay, and the other was to have a family. And I thought one of those things made the other impossible, and I found the conflict intolerable. And I spent years and years trying to make things work with women so I could have a family and then feeling a bit dishonest, and then being off with men and feeling so disappointed at what I was giving up and what I was losing. And the lie, the lie that haunted my childhood was the lie that those two things were so mutually exclusive. When I was little, there was a, uh, someone who lived uh, in a building just a few doors down from the one where I grew up in New York. And um, they had a basset hound, and we had a basset hound. And basset hounds, as many of you may know, walk at their own pace. <laughs> and in the evenings when my father would walk our basset hound, he would run into Elmer, who was walking his basset hound, and the two of them would talk and have a lovely time. And it turned out that Elmer and his partner Willie owned a gift shop that was a few blocks away. And my mother took to stopping in there occasionally, when she'd been out taking my brother and me to the park. And Willie and Elmer became part of our family. They spent Christmas with us, they spent Easter with us, they were around a great deal of the time. And I was always puzzled by the fact that Elmer had been studying medicine at Yale, he was in medical school, and then he went off to fight in the Second World War. And when he came back, he never pursued medical school again. And when I asked him about that, he said, oh well, I'd seen terrible things in the war, and I didn't have the stomach for medicine anymore. And it was only many years later that Willie finally said to me, after Elmer died, but nobody would go to a gay doctor in 1945. It was out of the question, and Elmer couldn't bear to live in secrecy, so he decided he wouldn't be able to be a doctor. That was the lie he grew up in. You couldn't be gay and be a doctor. Fifteen years ago, I met John, who's now my husband. And when I met him, it was the beginning of great happiness and the end of great unhappiness. And some of the time, the unhappiness, the disappearance of that unhappiness upstaged the happiness itself because I had had so many years of torture and self-doubt and the disappearance of those things was, in some senses, the more prominent change. But bit by bit, that shifted. When I met John, he mentioned to me that some lesbian acquaintances had asked him whether he would be the donor for them to have a child, and that he had done so, and that they had a son whose name was Oliver. Their names were Tammy and Laura. And he said that he had remained quite disengaged from them and from their life because it was important that everyone understand that Tammy and Laura were the child's two parents. But Laura had said, well, he should call you something that indicates the relationship. She said, perhaps he could call you donor dad. <laughs> Little Oliver had had a rough time wrapping his mind around that, so he called John donut dad. <laughs> And then, a little while after John and I had met, they asked him to be a donor again, and he was a donor again, and along came Lucy. In the meanwhile, one of my best friends from university had said to me, 
when I asked her how she felt about her divorce, that she was relieved to be out of a bad marriage, but that she really wished that she had had children. And I said very lightheartedly, well, if you ever decide you really want children, I've always wanted children and I'd be glad to be the father. But it never occurred to me that she would take that seriously. She was someone who was quite beautiful, always had dozens of men after her, and so I was rather shocked when she decided that she really did want to go forward. And indeed, we went ahead and we created a pregnancy, and by that time, John and I had decided to get married, which we did in Northamptonshire, and um, Blaine came to the wedding pregnant with our daughter, and John pointed out that it was probably the first gay shotgun wedding. <laughs> And then little Blaine was born. And then John and I decided we wanted to have the experience of bringing up a child in our own home full time. And so we have George, of whom I am the biological father and John is the adoptive father. We had an egg donor. And Laura said when she knew what we were planning, I could never find a way to thank you for giving me Lucy and Oliver who are the light of our lives but I could show you how much I appreciate it by offering to be your surrogate. And so Laura carried the pregnancy. And during that time when she was pregnant, we spent a lot of time with Laura and with Tammy and with Oliver and Lucy, and we all felt ourselves drawing closer and closer together. And when George was born, and we said that he would call me daddy and John Papa, as my daughter, little Blaine, called me daddy and John Papa John, they said that they would like to call us Daddy and Papa too. And so all of a sudden, we found ourselves with four children who were somehow in our orbit. Four children with, since Blaine by that time had met Richard and got attached to him, six parents, um, <laughs> and in three different states. Um, and I uh, was very amused when little Blaine went for her school interview. There are ludicrously school interviews for kindergarten in much of America. And they asked the children to do a few things in a row, and she did most of them. And then toward the end, they said, and now we'd like each of you to draw a picture of your family. <laughs> and little Blaine said, no. And they said, no, no, we just, everyone is now going to do that. Would you just draw a little picture of your family? And she said, it's too complicated. <laughs> this life, this life that I now have was a life that was completely unimaginable to me when I was growing up. And I sometimes think if I could have seen a snapshot of this life, that it would have prevented me from so many years of anxiety and despair. I wouldn't even have had to know that it was a snapshot of my life. I would just have had to know that it was a snapshot of a possible life, because it certainly hadn't seemed possible to me. I'm involved in the Lesbian and Gay Studies program at the university where I studied, which was founded by someone who went there in the 50s. And I hear him talk about his experiences and I wonder how he survived it all. And I'm so grateful that I was there in the 1980s. And then I meet these young students and I listen to them talk about things. And I recognize their sense of possibility. And I feel a deep envy for what they know could happen. And I say when I talk to them, that my fondest hope is that when they're 50 and they come back, they'll feel that envy for the next generation too. At a Passover Seder organized by my Anglican stepmother, she asked my Catholic husband <laughs> to read the prayer that stipulated as being for the mother, one that I remember my own mother reading years ago. And as John spoke those lines, those optimistic lines about the voice of the turtle being heard in our land, I remember thinking to myself, is he the mother? I'm the one who has a career and he's the one who's a stay-at-home dad, but are we somehow in those roles, those pre-existing roles? And bit by bit, I came to find more and more that it was sort of an annoyance having to deal with people who insisted that the equality of gay families was contingent on the equivalence of gay families. Because my point of view is that a gay family is not exactly the same as a straight family, but that it's just as good as a straight family. My point of view is 
that there are many different kinds of families, that a rich family is different from a poor family, that a family in which the child has come about through an accidental teenage pregnancy is different from a family in which a much sought child was achieved through assisted reproduction. My sense is that a British family is different from a family in Thailand, that there are many kinds of families and that we do a gross disservice to all of them when we insist that there's some sort of ideal to which they all need to aspire. And so now when people say to me, as people say all the time, so which of you is really the mom? I sometimes say, which chopstick is the fork? <laughs> and I've got to know a lot of people who are pulling apart this idea of family, who are making it broader. I have one friend, a gay woman, married to another woman. They wanted to have a child. They had a close friend who was gay. They asked him whether he would like to be the donor for their child. And he said he would actually like to be the father of their child. So he leads a life which I think is euphemistically described as polyamorous. And uh, the three of them live together and are bringing up those children together. I met someone else recently who described how he had wanted children and was talking to a good male friend of his who also wanted children, who then revealed that he was transgender and who upon testing discovered that his eggs were still viable. And so the two of them have a child who has two biological fathers. And just yesterday, I met, in North London naturally, a, um, uh, a lesbian woman who told me that she and her partner had also asked a gay friend to help them have a child, and that they have a child all together, um, two children in fact, one carried by one woman, one carried by the other, both fathered by the same man within the gay couple, and that the children, though they live with their mothers, spend every other weekend and Wednesday nights with their fathers. And as I listened to all of these stories, I thought how much what constitutes family has changed. I thought about open adoptions in which people know both their family of biological origin and the family that's mostly bringing them up. I thought about single parents and how people are always saying, ah, the single mother, she has to be mother and father. And I thought, no, she has to be a single mother, which is something different. And it can be very, very hard, but I've seen people who are carrying it off beautifully. And I thought about this increase in binaries. And I thought about a world in which the presence of abortion has meant that people who don't want children, by and large, are able not to have them and in which reproductive technology has meant the people who do want children, by and large, are able to have them. And then I thought about the ways in which fatherhood has changed across the board with all of these shifts. And it seems to me that the women's movement was all about women claiming for themselves the prerogatives that had frequently um, been assigned only to men. And men at that time could never acknowledge that they wanted anything of what had been the province of women they couldn't acknowledge any of it because it would be uh, something that would impinge on their masculinity. But over time, men gradually noticed that while some of the things that were traditionally women's work, cleaning the house and so on, were rather unwelcome, that there were other aspects, not much fun, um, <laughs> that there were other aspects that were quite rewarding. And they gradually realized that having that primacy in the life of your child that attachment which is not only the reason for taking care of your child but also the consequence of taking care of your child was incredibly valuable. And almost all the fathers I know of my generation are more involved in childcare than their own fathers were. And I think that's been a great and glorious and unsung liberation. The poet Louise Gluck once said, birth, not death, is the hard loss. She was talking partly just about the difficulties of existence, but I think she was also talking about the way in which you have children and everything changes, how everything changes beyond recognition, and how feelings you didn't know that you had deep inside of you are suddenly let free and enter into the world. I think she meant that generation by generation, we struggle, transitional generation or otherwise, to love our children, to be good parents to them and still 
to be ourselves. I wondered sometimes whether it would be hard for a child to grow up knowing his family was different from other families. My 50th birthday was 18 months ago, and my family organized a party, and halfway through, my son George began pulling on John's sleeve and said that he wanted to make a speech. And John said, George, you can't make a speech. You're four. <laughs> Only Grandpa and Uncle David and I are making speeches tonight. But George insisted and insisted, and John didn't want to have a big scene during the party, and he finally said, all right, I'll take you up to the front and you can say something, make it short. <laughs> so they went up to the front of a room that had 200 people in it, and John picked George up behind the microphone, and George said, ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? And everyone turned around, very startled, and George said, I'm glad it's Daddy's birthday. I'm glad we all get cake. <laughs> and Daddy, if you were little, I'd be your friend. And I thought in that moment about all of the potential that's been kept locked away. I thought about Elmer not being able to be a doctor. I thought about the older gay people I knew who had never got to be parents. And I realized in that moment that I had the great luxury of being a parent and of having kept some reasonable measure of my integrity. And I thought how much better a father I was for having done it from the place of integrity than through a place of self-deception. Thank you.